Here's, here's my question. Here's my question. What do you smell like today? What, what do you smell like today? You know, sometimes it's hard to tell what you smell like, right? It's, not, it's easy to tell how somebody else smells and somebody new smells when the new smell comes into the room, but how do, how do you smell today, right? Most of the time, we smell like where we've been, right? What we've been doing, what we've been around, right? Imagine you spend uh, an hour or two in a coffee shop. You walk out of there, you're going to smell like coffee, right? Or let's say you spend time in the pool for a couple of hours. When you leave there, you're going to smell like chlorine, right? Uh, Here's the thing. You probably don't notice it yourself as much as somebody else notices it when you come around them. And this is also true. Those Those are not too bad of smells, chlorine and coffee, but it's also true with bad smells. Anybody here ever worked in a restaurant? Where, where are my servers at? Who's been a server before? How about, how about who worked in the back of the house in the kitchen? Any bus boys or bus girls in here? Like, yeah, I worked in all three of those things when I was younger. And I remember while at work, you know, I didn't I smell like the restaurant. Smell like, you know, you didn't, you didn't smell anything. I'd get home, I still wouldn't smell myself. But the next day, I'd pick up my uniform and I'd be like, ooh. It was like restaurant has its own like stink smell. I mean, this is a distinct stink that comes when you work in a restaurant. It smells like the food. It smells like all the stuff. And there's, it's the same thing, guys, when it comes to uh, um, the places and the things we allow in our lives. Our lives put off a, a smell, put, put off a, a distinct thing. Who we spend time with and what we allow in our lives will influence what permeates from our lives, how we think, how we act, even how we respond to things that happen around us, right? The Bible tells us this in 1 Corinthians 15, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. That means there was good character. That means there was something too corrupt. It doesn't just say bad company, you know, is bad company. No, no, it says bad company corrupts good character. Character. So today I want to discuss the impact of our relationships, the impact of the influences of the things we allow in our lives. So we've been on this body series. We're going to keep it going today. Today we're going to call the message body odor. All right. Body odor. Okay. So I'm going to start with this question. If you were arrested today for being a Christian, for being a disciple of Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict you? No, no, seriously. Think about it. Would there be enough evidence to convict you? Not by what you say, not by what you claim, but evidence. Like like if investigators went to your job and they spoke to your coworkers and they spoke to your boss, right? If they they searched through your home and they looked through your phone, talked to your neighbors, if they went and did some research when it comes to all your social media profiles and where you've been online, would they find enough evidence to convict you of being a real follower Of Jesus? Or would the jury just say there's reasonable doubt? But you know, maybe. Just not sure. See, I'm thinking this. I'm thinking if we call ourselves disciples of Jesus, right, shouldn't there be real evidence of that? Like actual evidence? Shouldn't it be easy to tell the difference between um, those who are lost and hurting and still don't know Jesus and those who claim to be disciples? Shouldn't it be easy to see the two? See, because too many times what I find is that um, they're both watching and listening and to the same junk on their phones, computers, TVs, however you want to say it. They're both hanging around the same people doing the same things, which causes them both to act and talk and speak and respond to life's challenges the same way. Everybody say this. You've heard me say it a bunch of times. I want it to be a mantra in our lives. Whatever you say, garbage in, garbage, garbage, out. garbage out. They say it in Spanglish. Basura in, basura, basura, out. basura out. All right? Garbage in, garbage out, right? Whatever garbage we allow into our lives, guess what? It's going to permeate and come out of us as well, inevitably. Now, I want you to listen to what 2 Corinthians 6, 4 through 18 says. I'm sorry, it's 14 through 18. It says this. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How could righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For, are the, for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. 
I will be their God and they will be my people. Verse 17, therefore come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Don't touch their unclean things and I will welcome you and I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Listen to verse 17 one more time. Therefore come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch their unclean things and I will welcome you. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time to take the garbage out. Anybody here get excited when you got to take the garbage out at home? Anybody? So I'm going to see if there's any weirdos in the room. No, I mean, you hear that and there's something to that, right? You're like, man, I don't want to touch it. I don't want to get near it. It's annoying. It's inconvenient. I got to walk in here. Man, we've been looking for homes. We've been thinking about purchasing a home. And there's some places that's one of the things I think about. I don't, even have, I don't think my wife's ever heard me say this. But there was one house I just looked and I was like, where do they keep the garbages at? And I was like, they keep the garbages here. Holy cow, we got to walk that garbage all the way out there for the truck. You know, it was, it, you know it's just an inconvenient thing. But guys, listen to me. It's time to take the garbage out. It's time to get a little uncomfortable, a little inconvenient, because we ain't want our house to stink. We don't want, God just said we are the temple of God, right? I mean, the temple of God shouldn't stink. It's time to take some of the garbage out, okay? And you might be thinking, well, Pastor Mike, are you saying that we should completely avoid people that don't know Jesus? Listen to me clearly. No. That's not what I'm telling you. You guys know my heart, especially if you've come here for a little while. I told you Jesus came and he left the 99 to go after, and we're supposed to look and be like him, right? I'm saying this. I'm saying we need to be intentional about what and who we allow into our life so close that it influences, so much so that it actually changes us from within. I'm telling you that if we're supposed to be Jesus' body, which is where this series all came from, the church, I mean, the Bible calls us the body of Christ, then shouldn't the body of Christ look like Jesus, live like Jesus? Jesus, or we should follow his example. And if I look at Jesus' example, I see that he didn't shy away from talking to, from eating, from helping those that didn't call him Lord yet, that were lost and hurting. As a matter of fact, what I see is a God that is intentional about at times, sometimes, purposely going towards the lost and the broken. For example, the Samaritan woman at the well. This is a woman that not only wasn't saved, right? She didn't know Jesus. She was actively living in sin publicly, enough so where even the town knew her as someone that wasn't living for Jesus, right? But what does Jesus do? He still chooses to go towards her. He still chooses to talk to her. But why, this would be the question, to reveal himself to her. Does that make sense? There's a, there's a reason behind it. She, she actually becomes one of the first evangelists to her town. Her whole city and town ends up hearing about Jesus because Jesus reveals himself to her. Yet she was lost and broken. You know. So how do you stay separate but still go towards the lost? You have Matthew, right? Another good example. Matthew, the tax collector. Jesus goes to this guy, Matthew, and he invites him to follow him. Not when he's living well, not when he's saved and a good guy. No, no, no. Even though he's a hated, sinful tax collector, Jesus at that moment says, I invite you to come and follow me. The next thing we see is Jesus is at Matthew's house, hanging out with all his sinful, hated tax collector friends. But what is Jesus doing there? He's intentionally there revealing himself and who he is to them, sharing the gospel. Listen, if we want to live like Jesus, then yes, we have to spend some time with those who need him. But here's a deeper question. Where and with who did Jesus spend most of his time with? With the disciples, right? He spent most of his time with his disciples and other believers, right? With Lazarus, with Mary. Like you have specific people that he spent his time with. These people were his community, they were his close friends. They were the ones that he shared his life with. They were the ones he cried with, he laughed with, he prayed with, and ultimately he lived on mission with. You've heard me say this, like you weren't created to live alone. You and I were not created to try to walk this thing out by ourselves. Not at all. We were made for community. You want to tell you the best and healthiest place you'll find community is when you start living on mission and those that gather around you to live on mission with you, you make that your community. 
that's when all of a sudden you'll see yourself being pushed towards the Lord and towards your purpose of your life rather than being pulled away from it. Let, let, me, let me ask you this question. You know, if, if Jesus came for the lost, then why didn't he spend all his time with lost and forget the 12 and forget spending time with others that, that were of the faith? Why, why did he waste so much time going off alone you know, in the mornings and at night and at different times. Why? Because he knew that he had to be close to the Father and he had to surround himself with people that were on mission with him. He was showing us how we're supposed to live. Right? Let me ask you this question. Do you think that when people spent time with Jesus, it felt different, there was something different about it than when they spent time with any other person? Do you think that's true? Absolutely. When they spent time with Jesus... Um, all of a sudden, it was like, man, there's just something about him. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a peace that seems to permeate from him. There's a, a joy, right? There's a hope in what he said and how he said it. I mean, he would just look at you, and somehow you became important just simply because he was giving you time. Like, uh, there was something about him that just felt like you could smell it, right? You just because you were around him. Let me ask you this question. Where does Jesus dwell today? Where does the Bible says that his Holy Spirit dwells today? In us. So shouldn't it be the same when we walk into a room, when someone spends time with us, shouldn't they feel like there's something different about us? Shouldn't they feel some sort of, man, they, they, there's a peace, there's a joy, there's, a, there's just something. You know those people, just, man, when they're around, you're just like, man, there's just something about them that's different. Shouldn't that be the same? If we're supposed to be his body, the body of Christ, shouldn't we walk into the room and doesn't he walk in with us? See, I believe this. I believe that when someone is around us that doesn't know Jesus, I think they should feel like there's something different. I'm just going to give you two examples of some of the things they should feel. There's probably more. I'm sure there's more, but I'm just going to highlight two. Two things that I feel like someone that is lost, that is hurting, that doesn't know Jesus should feel around you and me. I think the first thing is, is they should feel like we got something they want. They should feel like, man, there's just something that they have. There's a, a real joy in how they speak, a real joy, a real hope that I just don't have. I mean, what, what is it that they have that I don't have? They should be around you and feel like, man, there's a confidence they have in who they are and what their purpose is that, man, it just, it just it's, like if they, it's like they're made on purpose and with the purpose and they believe that. They should spend time with you and be like, man, how do I have the same job you have and the same bad boss that you have and somehow you always have peace and I'm over here freaking out? How, how, come, how come when the pandemic hits, how come when this presidential election hits, how come when the world seems to be all anxiety and, and nervous and how come you still have peace? What is it about us that's different? There should be something that looks different, that feels different about us, and that's Jesus. Others should feel like we have something they want. Maybe they don't know what it is, but maybe that's because we haven't told them. How about the second thing? Here's the second thing. I think they should feel uncomfortable sinning around us. Because if Jesus is in the room, how many of y'all know everybody acts different? Shouldn't he be walking in the room with us? Maybe all of a sudden they feel uncomfortable gossiping to you, especially around you, Right? Maybe all of a sudden, um, you know, they, they feel awkward cursing around you, talking inappropriately, sharing that joke, sharing that story. Maybe all of a sudden you get left out when they talk about that movie that you know is inappropriate, or maybe you don't get shared that video that everyone else got. How about we stop starting feeling left out and start recognizing that we're separate, and that's not a bad thing. Now, I don't want you to get me wrong. Because some of you guys might be thinking like, man, are you, are, you, are, are, are you saying point out people's sins? I'm not telling you to point out people's sins. I'm telling you to bring Jesus into the room. I'm telling you that people should know because you shared who you are in him, what he's doing in your life, right? That you're a disciple of him, that all of a sudden, just simply because of he who he is and he's in you and you represent him, it makes the room change. You know, what, what's sad is this, in, well, Instead of disciples sharing about Jesus, I find the opposite to be true most of the time. 
I see disciples all the time around unbelievers that are unafraid, unashamed, and could care less about saying uh, and talking things that just are inappropriate or not okay. And then I see the same believers feel scared and, and ashamed to share what God is doing in their life to the same unbelievers that are throwing all kinds of garbage in their life. Can I tell you why I think that is? It's actually, I don't even think it's, a, it's being afraid or even shame. It's because we don't want to be called hypocrites because our lives don't look any different than theirs. I think a lot of times it's simply like, you know what, my Sunday mornings might look different, but the rest of the week pretty much looks the same. Instead of setting ourselves apart, a lot of us, man, we have just become numb. We have just allowed and, and to just stuff to just come into our life. We listen to the same things, watch the same things, and then we expect different results. Let me tell you, I'm sorry, when you put the right ingredients together, you're going to get a cake. You can't expect to get something else. Maybe you're thinking, but Pastor Mike, you know, you, you've told us, go spend time with the 99. I mean, go spend time with the one, leave the 99. We're for the lost, for the broken, right? And you're like, I mean, I spend time with non-Christians, Pastor Mike, and I do what they do so I can be relatable. First of all, I'm just going to have to say it. Shut up. All right? No, no, I just want to be relatable so that, so that I can tell them about Jesus. If that were true, then let me respond with this. Okay, I'll give you that. When's the last time you told them about Jesus? If that's true, when's the last time you told them about Jesus and actually invited them to change their ways? When's the last time you told them, like, hey, man, God has something better for you than this? Because here's the truth. I, we may have started with the right intentions, right? Like, we were like, no, we genuinely want to reach people. And that's why I'm going to place myself here. But, but now you just became one of now, now we're starting to smell like them. We've been around them too much. We, we put our guard down too, too much. They've been too close. Jesus showed up to Matthew's house and met with all his friends. He didn't move into Matthew's house. You've heard me say this before. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. I've also said this, you know, friends are like elevators. They're either going to take you up or take you down. But I promise you, they're pushing buttons on your elevator. Who we spend our time with, right, and what we allow in our lives will influence how we think, will influence how we act, will influence how we speak. Most of us know, um, most of, anybody here not seen The Jungle Book? And most of us know The Jungle Book, Right? This, this movie is interesting because um, there's actually a real version of the Jungle Book, which is pretty wild. Um, in 1954, uh, there's a, a, there was a boy that was found in a forest in India, right outside, right outside a town called Lucknow. Okay? You can look this up. I promise I'm not making this up. You can look this up. Um, he was around seven or eight years old. They couldn't tell his age. All they knew is that he was um, real young and very, very malnutritioned when they found him. And uh, he couldn't speak any discernible language. He would only grunt and make noises. And um, they took him to an orphanage, and they uh, allowed this priest to take him in. And then the priest um, decided to document everything that he could about this boy as he tried to help him. Um, the, boy, the, the boy was named, or the priest called him Ramu, R-A-M-U. You can look this up, Ramu. And um, here's some of the things he wrote. I wrote them down. He said, uh, Ramu walked on all fours. And he had thick calluses on his knees and on his hands. And uh, his hair was long and matted. His teeth were jagged and cracked, and so were his gums, as if he had gnawed on bark and hard items. It said um, he would growl and bite at people whenever they came around him. And uh, the other thing he wrote, was, which I was interested, he would ignore the cooked food he would give them, but then they would catch him gnawing on raw meat whenever he found it. And at the end, anthropologists and psychologists said this. They said, Ramu exhibits behaviors associated with feral children. His behavior suggests that he has been living in the wild for a long time, possibly being raised by wild animals, maybe even wolves. How wild is that? Here's, here's my point. Ramu isn't actually a wild animal. You guys know that. He's acting like it. He might even think he is, Right? He was just a little human being. He was just a little boy, just like every other little boy. The thing was that he grew up in the wild. He grew up with animals. So guess what? He became just like them. Now, I don't think that you or I have to worry about becoming a wild animal, at least most of us, right? 
But I'm gonna tell you this, if we allow ourselves to be surrounded by people and things that don't share our beliefs, that don't believe in Jesus and lean towards them, like Ramu, we are gonna become just like them. We are gonna speak and smell just like them. Corinthians says it, 1533, bad company corrupts good character. See, not only do we need to be careful about who we surround ourselves with, and, and, but we also need to make sure we don't get too comfortable. And here's what I mean by that. We can't get comfortable with our relationship with Jesus. That can't just be a thing that like, oh, we, we don't just become disciples. We are becoming, right? More like Jesus. To the day we die, we are becoming. If you've heard of our church, if you've been here a little while, you know our little saying, which is, you know, uh, belong, believe, and become. Anybody and everybody belongs in this place. I don't care where you're at in your journey with the Lord. If you walk in this place, hopefully you feel like you belong. At some point, you're going to get introduced to a God that loves you. And at that point, you're going to start believing. And then you're going to get to the third place, which is becoming, becoming more like him. And you're never going to get off that third spot. I'm still becoming. You're still becoming. I don't care who, if you got saved this morning or you're going to get saved in about 5, 10, 15 minutes, whenever we do the altar call, you will get to that place of believing and then you're going to be becoming. We are becoming who he has called us and we cannot become complacent. We can't just say, you know what, you know what, I'm good when it comes, I've become a disciple. No, 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 you're still becoming more like him. Our relationship with God should continually be growing just like any other healthy relationship. Think about the people you're closest to right now. Someone you would say, like, right now, you're like, man, I'm really close to this person. I bet you this. I bet you that's the person you talk to consistently. I bet you that's someone you probably spend time with. As a matter of fact, right now, Tammy and I could probably, would probably say, like, who are you close to right now? Oh, we're kind of close to the Campbells. We're kind of close to the Stevenses. Why? Because we recently spent a couple days with them having a good time, making memories with our families, just, you know, eating good food. Like, who you're close with, who you're talking to, who you're spending time with are the people you're going to be closest to, right? It's the same with God. You want to be close to God? You want to grow in your relationship with God? Guess what? You got to be with God, right? You got to spend time reading his word. You got to spend time praying. You got to spend time seeking him. You got to share your day with him. Oh, I share all the good stuff with him, and I definitely share when I need something. No, no, all of it. Man, good day, bad day, frustrating, happy, sad. I need this. You know what? Thanks for providing it. Man, are you sure you can't get more of this to me? Whatever you want to say, but as long as you're talking with him, you'll see that your relationship will grow, right? Imagine your relationship with God like a plant. If you water it, if you give it sunlight, right? If you give it your attention, what's going to happen to that plant? It's going to thrive. It's going to grow. But what happens if you don't give it water and you just leave it to the wayside and you just leave it there? It'll start withering and dying. I have a plant in my office somebody gave me not too long ago, and I have had to learn, hey, man, I got to water that thing twice a week. That's, I figured out that's, like, that's the spot right there. And, and, and it has a ton of huge leaves. I love it because it's super big and super green. And, and the leaves like literally respond to me spending time feeding it. And you know, I usually whisper a couple nice things to it because somebody else said to do that. But if I don't, if I don't do that, that tree goes literally from like this, the leaves are huge, they're like this, to like, it starts doing this. And if I miss two watering, which has happened, like I go out of town, I forget to tell somebody, I come back and the whole tree's like. <laughs> and here's the deal. I don't come back and notice it right away because in my peripheral vision, it's still there. And it's still kind of greenish. But it's when I give it my attention, I'm like, oh, that's not, whoa, hey, let's get happy again, you know? And it's funny, a little bit of water, a little bit of this, and I mean, within days, it's like, you know? It's the same with our relationship with God. Some of us leave God and our relationship in our peripheral vision. We're like, oh, I'm a disciple. It's over here. We don't pay attention to it, and little by little, our relationship is dying, is withering, and we don't even recognize it. And if you do that long enough, sometimes you kill your relationship. It's unhealthy, and it's, you can still say, I, got a, I mean, I can leave an unhealthy, dying plant in my office and be like, I got a plant in my office. And all of you guys, if I, you never saw it, you'd be like, Pastor Mike likes plants. He has a plant he takes care of in his office. And then you'd walk in one day and be like, that's what he calls a plant? And the plant's like, Bleh. you know, like, some of us are walking around with dead relationship with God, but we tell ourselves and we tell our people we're disciples of Jesus, and what we're doing is they're looking at our lives going, smells like it's dying. The closer we get to God, the more actually we understand who he is, the more we understand who we are, who we're supposed to be. 
What are those things in our life that are pulling us away, that are pulling us away from our purpose and our plan? Some of us are like, just show me what it is that I need to get rid of, and I will. He'll show you if you ask him. He'll show you if you spend time enough long with him that he can share with you what those things are. See, we can't be complacent when it comes to our relationship with God. And here's another thing we can't do. We cannot, we cannot allow ourselves to become numb. Numb to the negative things in our life either. Here's what I mean by that. We can't be so numb to the world and to the things that are not of God that we just let our guard down and we just allow whoever or whatever to permeate our lives. Anybody ever heard you are what you eat? That saying, you are what you eat? Well, the same is true when it comes to the people you hang out with and the stuff you allow in your life. You are who you hang out with. You are, you will become the things that you allow in your life. Maybe you never planned on, let's say, uh, drinking alcohol, but you become numb to it around you. You let people talk about it around you all the time. You go to parties and places where they're drinking all the time. And little by little, you just become numb to it so it no longer stands as something like, hey man, that's not something that I want in my life that's gonna push me towards Jesus. Because it's no longer about heaven or hell. Once you're a disciple, you're about getting closer to Jesus. You're not worried about that line anymore. You're just worried about getting closer and becoming more like him. And little by little, you're, you're looking at that. Or maybe it's cursing. Here's an easier one. Maybe it's cursing. You, you just let people curse around you all the time. You've gotten so used to the cursing in the movies, in the music, in the things that you watch and you allow in your life that all of a sudden, what happens is those things that are outside start coming in you. And the Bible says that what's in you will actually come out of you. Any of you guys ever find yourself saying something and you're like, why did I say it, that? Where'd that come from? Why did I act like that? Maybe it's things that are coming in you that you don't realize that all of a sudden are coming now out of you, you know? And it doesn't seem like a big deal at first because at first, it's just a little thing. It's like, um, it's like seeing a weed in a garden. You see a weed, you're like, oh, it's only one weed. It's not a big deal. What happens after a little while if you just ignore it? You become numb to it. You just see it and it just becomes part of the background. You'll get two weeds and three weeds. And then all of a sudden, even the healthy things that was what was healthy before actually starts getting choked out by the negative things, by the weeds. It's the same when it comes to our life. What's really sad is that all of a sudden, what was good, right, becomes, we start off being numb to the bad things By the end of it, we're actually numb to the good things as well. And all of it is unhealthy. Now, maybe you're here and you're thinking, well, Pastor Mike, I gotta be honest with you. I hear you, but man, I'm I'm too smart to let those things affect me to that level. You know, I'm I'm too strong of a disciple or I'm too this or I'm too that. And and for a lot of us, it's, it's, it's pride, but we also just really believe like, man, the enemy's a roaring lion. I might not see him before he pounces, but once he pounces, man, I could, I mean, I got it. From there, I know what to do. That, you know, let me, let me tell you something. He is so sneaky and sly that he usually doesn't put a giant weed next to you. He just plants a seed. And if he can just get you to ignore that thing, water that thing, not care about that thing, it'll choke you out even from the roots before it ever, you ever see it on, 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 the, on the outside. We have to understand that the enemy is real. And, 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 and here's the deal, guys. Let, let, me, let me do it this way. Maybe you're here and you're thinking you're too smart, you're too strong, you're too whatever. Let me um, end this sermon. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this to a close here by, by sharing about um, a guy that we would all consider to be pretty smart, okay? Uh, he's a biblical character. His name is Solomon. Some would say he's the smartest guy on the planet that's ever walked the earth, the wisest man that ever walked the earth, okay? According to the Bible, Solomon, when he was young, he loved the Lord, he followed the Lord closely, okay? As a matter of fact, in, in, a, in 1 Kings 3, 3, it talks about um, that Solomon showed his love for the Lord and he, he listened and he learned by watching his father, David. And everybody remember how David was described? David was a man after God's own heart. So Solomon would watch his dad love the Lord, lean into the Lord, and he'd be like, oh, I'm gonna do that. And the Bible says that even as a young man, as a young person, Solomon would worship the, the God and, and he, would, um, he would actually um, uh, bring offerings, right? And sacrifice offerings unto the Lord. And he would do all these things, why? Because he loved the Lord, right? He loved the Lord. So much so that God finally comes to him in a dream and he says, ask for whatever you want me to give you. You talk about somebody asking for whatever you want. Can you imagine if God asked you that? I want some of that, right? God coached him and said, ask for whatever you want. 
And we know what Solomon asked for, right? Solomon asked for a discerning heart and wisdom. A discerning heart and wisdom. And God is so pleased by his request. The fact that he can ask for anything and he asks for a discerning heart and wisdom. God is so pleased by that that God responds with, bro, not only am I gonna give you that, but I'm gonna give you wealth. I'm gonna give you power. I'm gonna give you influence. I'm gonna give you honor. Like you, come on, son. You ever been so proud of somebody? You're like, oh, you get a bonus. <laughs> you get it. Like you get a, you know, some, my kids are like that. I have, well, one of my kids is like that. One of my kids is like, what do you want? They're like, I want a pony, a farm, the lake, the moon, the stars. I asked my other kid, like, I'll give you anything what you want. He's like, can I get Cheerios? <laughs> I'm like, son, I'll give you Cheerios and milk. Come on. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? You, guys, you, you know, you, this is Solomon to God. He's like, man, you, wow, you only asked for this. And such a good thing. I'm going to give you everything. This guy is the wisest person on the planet. When God gives you something, he gives it to you in droves. He doesn't, he's not kind of wealthy. He's like super wealthy, super influential, super smart, super powerful, super all these things. And here he is. And, and he's young, incredibly wise, has all these things. It sounds like Solomon has it all together. And he does. While he's focused on God. Because the Bible continues, goes on to tell us that as Solomon grew older, he started allowing ungodly people and ungodly things to surround his life. And he probably thought, like we do, mm, I'm pretty confident in myself. I'm pretty smart. Look at me. Look at all the wise choices I've made. Look at, look at how strong I am. I mean, if somebody, if, man, if I was doing something dumb, I would notice it. I mean, somebody would tell me and I'd understand. Like, and he probably started thinking that way and he started allowing, he started becoming numb to the negative things. And he just started allowing things to come into his life that he shouldn't have. And next thing you know, he marries, the Bible tells us he marries a foreign woman who, who, who worships false gods. And at first he might have been like, well, I mean, that's what she does. It's not what I do. Anybody ever said that? That's what they do. It's not me. I'm not the one watching it. I'm not the one doing it. I'm just listening to the gossip. I'm not the one gossiping as if gossip only happens in one direction. Right? And then, it, and then he goes and what, is this, what does he do next? He marries another foreign woman with false gods and then another and then another, right? You ever done something wrong? You're like, I thought something worse would happen to me. Maybe it's not so bad to do this. And little by little, he just continues to allow this influence in his life. Now, I want you to remember this. Remember how wise, wealthy, influential, powerful this guy was. Listen to 1 Kings 11.4. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. I thought he was supposed to be super wise. I mean, if anybody was wise enough to make sure this doesn't happen, wouldn't it be them? It gets worse. This is chapter 11, verses 9 through 11. It says this. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you. And give it to one of your subordinates. How sad is that? So much promise. I thought he loved the Lord. I thought he was wise. You see, guys, when we all of a sudden start drawing away from the Lord, allowing other things, other influences into our lives, it doesn't matter how smart we are. It doesn't matter how strong we are. The fact that we are not leaning into the Lord and having him close and hearing his voice will instantly begin to cause us to fall away. To, to, since it's called body odor, to smell more like the world than him. Solomon's story has to be a reminder to us of how intentional we need to be. Intentional about who we are, can allow to come into our lives and spend their lives with us and, 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 and influence our lives. Same thing goes with stuff, the things we allow into our lives. 
a reminder that it's not about how smart we are or how strong we are. It's all about how we're pursuing Jesus. I say we learn from Solomon's story. I say we take it for the example that it is and all of a sudden make the decision of being intentional. Man, I'm gonna be intentional to focus on God. I wanna be intentional about my relationship with Jesus. I'm gonna be intentional about looking at my life and checking myself and seeing what can and shouldn't be uh, in my life. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna close with a simple question. I already asked it to you earlier, but I want us to walk away asking this question. I want us taking some time this week and really, really trying to answer this. If you were arrested today for being a follower of Jesus, for being a disciple of Jesus, would there really be enough evidence? Evidence to convict you without a doubt? Or are there enough things and things in your life that you're allowing that would cause some reasonable doubt? Let me encourage you, man. Go to the Lord. Open yourself up and just say, God, search my life. Holy Spirit, just show me what are the things that are separating me from you? Where, where are the seeds that I don't even see that I haven't focused on? And I promise you, it's not gonna be in your effort. You're not gonna be strong enough to do it on your own. But if you lean on him, he's the gardener. He's the one that'll show you here. Let's, let's, let's get rid of this. Let's shift away from this. And you'll see that even as you do it, you think it feels like, man, he's gonna tear these things out of my, well, how am I even gonna make it? It's funny how the healer can heal even while he's walking through the process. Everybody bow your heads, close your eyes. The Bible says this, you know, I might have given you that question, but the truth is that one day we're going to stand before the Lord and be judged. And when that day comes, what will the evidence of our life show? Will it show Jesus? Will it show the fruits of the spirit that are supposed to be evident in our life? Will, will, the, will we see love and joy? Will the evidence be peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, would it show self-control? Here's the thing, guys. If, if you're not sure that those things are evident, if you're not sure about your answer to that, then, man, I gotta tell you, there's a powerful truth that you need to grab a hold of today, and that's simply this. Jesus came and died so that you can have a fresh start. So that today, that, that can be wiped clean, and you can have a fresh start building up the evidence that is who you are. He did this so you can answer that question differently. Instead of being weighed down by sin and junk and pain and hurts, and you can be free. I mean, he went to the cross so that you can say, you know what, man? I, I can have joy, real joy. I can have real love. I can experience real peace. And most importantly, I can have a real relationship with the God who created me, who loves me and sees me and has a purpose for me. So if you're here and you're thinking, man, I need to change some things. I need to change some of the things I've allowed in my life. I need to change how I'm pursuing the Lord. Like I told you, man, the first step isn't trying to get rid of those things on your own. It's about letting Jesus in. It's about asking for grace and forgiveness and knowing that with his help, you're going to be able to walk away from those things. Today is the day you turn to Jesus. Today is the day he begins to change you from the inside out. If that's you and you're ready to make that change, to go to him ask for forgiveness and invite them into your life to start making those changes. If that's you, then right now, just open your eyes and look up at me. Don't worry about anybody else. If that's not you, just keep your head bowed. And if you're a believer, just start praying for those in the room. But if that's you, just open your eyes and look up at me. I'm gonna pray that prayer, a simple prayer of repentance, of grace, of inviting Jesus in. I'm gonna look around the room. This is between you and Jesus, not between me and you, but I do want to know who I'm praying with. So I'm going to look around the room. It's hard to see faces because of these lights. So if you're looking at me, could you get my attention by just saying, hey, that's me, Pastor Mike. I'm with you in this prayer. I'm just going to scan the room if that's you. You can put your hand right back down after I see it. But just let me know you're here and that's you. I got you, bro. And you right behind him. Yeah. I got both you guys. Yeah. I see all three of you upstairs. I got you, bro. I got you up there. I see you right there. I 
got you in the corner and I got you down here. Just gonna wait one more second because I know the enemy slick me and he could be trying to convince one of y'all this isn't for you. And that's not true. It is for you. I got you, boss. If you raise your hand, the Bible says this in Romans, that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he is Lord, that today is the day of salvation. That means today is the day the past gets erased and you get to begin anew. So let's pray for that right now. If you raise your hand, repeat after me or say something like this, just make it a prayer between you and God. Say, Jesus, I am doing what your word says. I am confessing with my mouth that you are Lord, that you are who you say you are, that you did come from heaven to earth, you lived the perfect life, and then you gave your life on a cross to pay for my sin. And Lord, I admit, I am sinful I've done some things I wish I wouldn't have done. I've allowed some things in my life that I wish I wouldn't have allowed. And God, I'm sorry. So right now, Lord, I turn to you because I'm gonna need help. Would you help me? Would your Holy Spirit search my life and show me those things that I need to walk away from, that I need to turn away from? Would you help me to place guards in my life and guard my eyes and my ears and the things I allow into me? Jesus, I love you. And although I am guilty because I'm turning to you, I believe that you can make me innocent and that now I am new and I am yours. So fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me your joy, your peace, your purpose. And I say, Lord, that from this day forth, I no longer live for this world. I no longer live for myself. I live for you and I walk with you. I am yours. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Come on, everybody said.